I'll welcome everybody back. And again, invite people who are comfortable and able to turn your videos on. It's really, really nice as presenters to see faces. Um, <clears throat> so this uh, last session for today will be facilitated by Dr. Mary Sweetman. And she is a professor in the Department of Community Development at Acadia University. She was at our very first symposium five years ago um, and has been involved in establishing inclusive post-secondary education at Acadia and across the province. Um, so I'll hand over the session to you, Mary, um, and we'll get started. Thank you. And thank you for, for having me once again. It is such a privilege to be in this space and to um, be in this community of practice. And I just wanted to go back to that from um, what you introduced us to that at the beginning of the symposium and how important that is to be in community, in dialogue um, around these practices. And so, yeah, and, and just how much I appreciate it being on the, on, on the other side from a lot of you. Um, of Turtle Island and to be able to engage in dialogue with you is just such a privilege. So thanks for having me. Um, I wanna start by, uh, I'll go to my next slide, but I just wanted to start with this quote from Paulo Freire, who, who we're gonna dig into a little bit today. So we're gonna try to marry some theory and practice, which we've you know already been doing from all the other presenters so far have really engaged us in this dialogue around consciousness. So it's exciting. I'm hoping that you'll see some synergies. So education does not transfer the world. Education changes people. People change the world. And this session is called Creating Spaces for Social Transformation, Paulo Freire, and Inclusive Post-Secondary Education. And I'll just start um, with a landing and introduce Freire concepts. And then I'm hoping to spend most of our time in activity in reimagining the post-secondary experience and then a share a debrief and a commit at the end. So first I am coming from um, the east coast of Turtle Island, um, which is the unceded and un uh, ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And this land is called Mi'kma'ki. And um, it's really important that I ground my practice in the place that I am in. And so whatever I'm talking about today in the next hour and whatever we engage in, I think I always go back to place and that I'm, I teach in a department called community development and it's really important to be grounded in the place that we are. And so things that work in one institution, um, thing that what's something that works in one community or with one student may not be um, able to transform directly from another place. So um, I just want to acknowledge that um, I, I'll share some practices, share some ideas, but that um, this, this is a learning community based on the land that I'm on, um, and I um, respectfully live, learn, play on this land. Uh, I also just wanted to um, just give you a little highlight of what we do at Acadia and two other institutions in Nova Scotia. In at Acadia, our um, our initiative is called Access Acadia and it is grounded within the institution and I'm the, the faculty lead and we have a coordinator and it's the two of us who um, administer, recruit and work with faculty in order to engage our students um, in an inclusive opportunity here in post-secondary land that I am in. Um, so yeah, that's just a little background. I'll, I'll give some more examples as we go. But that's just a part of what I do. Uh, another big part of what I do is that I am a, a full-time faculty member and I teach classes in community development that are grounded in Freirean practice, um, which is um, a really important, and I see it as a thread throughout what we're learning as so well. I'll dig into it in a second. And then from the Freirean practice of um, a, a very popular book called Pedagogy of the Oppressed, I really teach a lot about asset-based community development, which is putting citizens into the center of uh, community practice of institutions. So it's putting our institutions on the outside and citizens in the middle when we make decisions uh, as a community. So let's get into it and feel free to put up your hand or just speak if you have questions or I should slow down or um, you need more context or anything. I'm happy to, to field anything, you, any questions you might have. So there might be some people in um, today who have lots of uh, experience with Paulo Freire, but I just wanted to give a Freire 101 
kind of outline around who this person is um, and, and why I wanted to connect it to inclusive post-secondary education and why it connects so deeply to my practice. I consider myself um, a community engaged practitioner scholar. When I do research, it's usually from um, a social feminist action research point of view, which means that anything that I do for, for research, I wanna implement practice into it and action into it. So there is definitely a social justice lens to the work that I do. Um, and I believe really strongly that education is not neutral. And so when we are teaching, it's a values education, no matter from what department um, has value, is, is values based. And so we'll get into that a little bit too. So Paul Freire um, talks about this, this idea of critical consciousness. And I know we've been talking about consciousness and unconsciousness a lot in the last two days. So this is exciting. So critical consciousness is really the first stage of social transformation from Paulo Freire's point of view. He was a, um, from Brazil. He was a philosopher and educator who worked with um, the people who were most oppressed in Brazil. Um, and he theorized and, and took action um, and created some amazing pieces of work that are still used and integrated into many education departments, um, many uh, sociology departments, community development departments, et cetera. So the first part is this critical consciousness. So education for liberation. So really debunking the idea of banking education. So education that is banking would be when the teacher with the power, the oppressor even, um, tells the student what to learn and the, le the learner digests it. They are um, an object in that in that relationship the the teacher is has the power and and is all knowing and the student does not know does not get to um, express their experience based on that information share so it's a one way so Paulo Freire calls calls that out and says we we should not be educating in that way we need a critical consciousness we need to liberate our education and that the, the teacher and the student must be teacher and student, that they must be both teacher and they must be both student. And so the process of awareness that begins as people start to question their everyday reality and make connections between their personal lives and their political lives. And so Paulo, Paulo Freire also teaches us that education is political and that um, social justice and equity has to be at the center. And so once you become conscious of this, when you become conscious of the contradictions that you have learned, um, like Lisa had said, that unlearning, when you have to start unlearning, then we can move into collective action. And so empowerment cannot happen as an individual, it has to happen as a collective. And so collective action happens within community. This must lead, this, co this consciousness must lead to co collective action through empowering community. And this cannot just be the empowerment of the student or the oppressed, but also the oppressor. And so Freire often talks about the humanity of learning. And that if we're just making education more humane or our communities more humane for those that were oppressed, we're not making it oh, humane for the oppressor. And so those, so both are, are not getting a humane experience, both the oppressor and the oppressed. So we must liberate both. Both need to be liberated. And these are two really important Freirean concepts uh, and dialogue I'll get into. I've got a slide on that that I'll get into, into next. And praxis is the relationship between action um, and reflection. And so that we must be in this constant circle cycle of theory, uniting theory and action, reflecting and then taking action and always being okay and on uh, with criticizing ourselves, with being conscious of ourselves, so it, which goes back to Marcia's um, great questions that she had for us around what was your high school experience like? And then being like, right, I was, I was taught these things and now I have to unlearn them as Lisa was saying. So um, those things create this collective action, which allows us to then socially transform. And social transformation um, from, from Freire's point of view would be the ultimate goal that we're transforming our places and spaces to be more equitable 
uh, to be more humane, to be more democratic in the true sense of democracy, um, to be more liberated. And that we do that for the spectrum of individuals in our community. So how does this relate to inclusive post-secondary education? I'm sure that you can see how the benchmarks, for example, um, that were brought to us throughout this, the last two days, um, speak to a fraying practice of liberation, of putting uh, students in the center of their learning. Um, and that these, that to me, these are fundamentally connected to my dedication and to my, um, my work around inclusive post-secondary here at Acadia and the roles, uh, role that I can play as a, as a faculty member. So the work of critical consciousness and then collective action leads to social transformation. This happens through a collective action, whether it's projects, campaigns, alliances, a network. So all of those things. So these are practical things. We can, we're gonna unpack the practicality of this theory. Um, and, and try to relate it to our own lives and our own work in inclusive post-secondary education. So I wanted to spend a moment looking at dialogue a little bit more before we go off into our groups, <laughs> because I'm hoping that we can uh, not only go into breakout rooms and, and talk with each other and try to reimagine a post-secondary institution that's transformed, that could be socially transformed, that can be liberating for all students. Um, but I also wanna practice in those breakout sessions, true dialogue. So communication from the heart, really listening to each other uh, and just practicing how, what, it, what it feels like and what it, what it could be like to have a, a really deep conversation. And I, and I already see that so many people are engaged in that way of, of communicating when I'm in, for, you know, every time I come to one of these symposiums, I'm, I'm uh, delighted with how people communicate so respectfully and, and from the heart. But just to give you some background on Freire's definitions of dialogue is that dialogue is the heart of critical consciousness. And critical consciousness is marrying the personal and the political. And so when we're able to be conscious, not only of our actions and why we might have this bias that we need to disrupt and unlearn, but it's also connecting it to the political to say that there are systems, there are systemic reasons why I have that learning, um, that my education was not value free, that there's a reason why I didn't learn about residential schools, for example, in my elementary and high school, um, that there is this connection between the personal and the political when I become a conscious, when I become a critical pedagogue, when I become a critical conscious person. Dialogue is in relationship, so it's a relational practice. It is a relational practice that requires mutual, respectful, reciprocal communication. Reciprocal is when there's that give and take between the two people in dialogue. And very really believe that it was an engagement from the heart and the mind. And I, I think about this when I meet with students who are new to Access Acadia, uh, to have what I call learning conversations with them and to spend you know, to book a tremendous amount of time, a whole afternoon, I'd like to do it over a meal or a coffee or a tea and just explore what their passions are, what their interests are. And I would call that a learning conversation that my goal is to, to be in conversation and that having a good conversation is an artful practice. Um, it takes practice, it's, it's an art to have a relaxed informal conversation that builds empathy and trust to understand someone's concerns. So when we, I work in community development and I often work with communities that have experienced oppression or marginalization and building trust is a really important part of being able to sit down with someone and really talk about what they're passionate about, what their assets are, what their gifts are and what their concerns are about the community. And then being able to genuinely have that dialogue and then take action, which is the, the praxis piece or the, the next part of this. The other part of dialogue is that the facilitator or the, or the critical educator um, believes in people's infinite potential, that everyone has gifts and everyone has assets, whether they're assets of the head, the heart, or the hands, we all have assets to bring to community, whatever community we're part of, and that it is my role as an educator to spend time with someone to understand what they're passionate, what they're passionate about and what their gifts and assets are. 
So that would be a, a Frarian definition of dialogue. Am I going too quickly? Is that, does that all, that sound good? So another little uh, Frarian quote is dialogue cannot exist without humility. And I think as a, as a, a faculty member in an institution that, that has its grounding in an ableist, imperialist, white supremacist, heteropatriarchy system, and I have to be honest about that, I have to know that that's where I work. I need to come to community with humility and I need to come to conversations with students no matter what stream they are coming into my classes from, uh, I have to engage in dialogue with them from a place of humility. And that's a practice, that, that is work. Okay, so what I'll do is I'm gonna stop sharing in just a moment, but I just wanted to do this part and then maybe pause to see if there's any questions, but I wanna set us up for a conversation, for a dialogue. So the activity is to actually spend most of this hour engaged in a dialogue around reimagining inclusive post-secondary institutions. And I want you to, in your conversation, consider how we would teach, how would we learn, how would we govern, how would the space be designed, um, would your role exist? So some of you might be uh, working in institutions, would you scrap your role altogether? Um, I want you to consider the inclusive post-secondary education ben benchmarks while you're having this conversation. But essentially what I want you to do, and I did this exercise a couple weeks ago with a, with a webinar that I was part of looking at Hope University. So what does a, if we could just get rid of everything at the institution, what would you welcome back or what would you redesign altogether in order to create an institution that creates hope um, and, and generates good learning uh, for students? And so I thought we could do that from a Paulo Freirean <laughs> context of, if you were to reinvent the institution so that it was inclusive, uh, what, what would it look like? And you might think, this is not realistic, we, we can't do that. We can't get rid of this system, it's so embedded. But I believe that if we can re-envision something, then there are tangible pieces that we can take from that re-envisioning to try to have that collective action to be able to push forward and to, to be social activists within our roles, whether we're faculty, facilitators, parents, students, and all the other hats that you wear. I'll give you an example. This past, um, this past year, I've been engaged in a book club where we're reading this book called Ungrading, Why Rating Students Undermines Learning. And since I've been teaching at Acadia for 10 years, and I've always hated grading and giving students grading grades. And I thought, well, I can't change that. I can't do anything about it. I have to give a grade. And through this book club, I realized maybe I don't maybe I don't need to give grades. And reading possibility models of other faculty across the United States and across Canada who have gotten rid of grading in their classroom. So they've disrupt the classroom and said, I can, I can own my own classroom in the way that I evaluate so that learning can become the center again, not credentials. And how inclusive would that be if we get rid of grading and stop judging ourselves compared to what the person beside us got on an exam. And although I can't not submit a final grade, so I can't disrupt the bureaucracy yet in my institution, but maybe I can redesign my syllabi to make it more inclusive by get rid of some of the grading or maybe get rid of grading altogether. Another example from a faculty point of view about reimagining, if I could just throw away the institution, um, is that maybe I could, um, come up with a totally new, new design for a class. And in the meantime, I could really work hard at redesigning my outlines or my syllabi to make sure that they follow universal learning design practices and principles. So something that I'm trying to do is make sure that there are multiple ways to show your learning. So it doesn't have to be an essay. The last thing doesn't have to be an essay. And in my syllabi, I usually incorporate five to six different ways that they can show their final learning. Um, and, and then that allows a student to get really excited about the project, 
because they can demonstrate their learning in a way that suits them. So although I'm not throwing out the whole system, this reimagining allowed me to say, okay, this is how I could redesign my syllabi. And that makes it more inclusive for not just my access students that come into my classroom, but for all of my students. It also shows a possibility model for other faculty on campus to say, you can do this and it actually enriches the classroom learning. So those are just some examples. So those are the questions that I'd like you to look at and I can put them into the chat or you can take a, a quick snapshot, but it's just around, I want you to just start from scratch. <laughs> How would you envision the institution to be more inclusive if you could start from scratch? Before I put you into groups, I just wanted to quickly go over some, some guidelines. So if you could select a note taker who could report back to the group, that would be great. You're gonna be in groups around four to five. So if you could you know, designate someone who, who enjoys taking notes and who doesn't mind speaking back to the group, if you could identify that person early on, that would be great. I suggest that the way you start maybe is introducing yourselves to each other, uh, grounding yourself in where you are and where you're at. Um, if you're comfortable, maybe the roles that you play. A suggestion if you feel like this would be helpful is to select a host who can help facilitate and share the space. So someone who doesn't mind being, you know, asking people for to, sh to, to share their ideas and so that making sure that you're kind of watching time and making sure everyone has, has some space and time. So that's a suggestion. I'm gonna try to get us into groups for about 20 minutes to dialogue. And so, you know, going back to those principles of dialogue around uh, really listening, really, um, uh, asking questions, when someone shares something, you know, ask a little bit more to get a little bit more information. And then what I'd like you to be doing is trying to think of uh, generative themes. Because when we all come back, I wanna give each group one minute to report back on the generative themes from your dialogue. Generative themes is another Frarian concept, which is these ideas that generate passion in the group. And there is some agreement. So if a group comes up with an idea to, um, you know, build classrooms that are all circular and um, because that would be a better way to learn is in, in circle as opposed to in chairs and in rows and all that kind of stuff, then, and you're all like, oh, that's so good. That's so great. I love that. Uh, then that would maybe be a generative passion for, uh, for a, a vehicle of change that you would want to bring back to the group. All right. I will stop sharing. Based on all of that, based on all that talk, um, are there any questions or things you want me to go into a little bit more before you go into, into some, some of your own uh, discussions? Does it seem clear? Well, I will let uh, Arden do the magic of group uh, dividing up. Hopefully you'll get with new people. Um, yeah, and enjoy your time together. We'll give you some uh, uh, you know, warning of when you have to, to come back, but for quite a bit of time. Well, I hope that you had um, uh, some good conversations around reinventing the institution. Um, maybe it's completely different or maybe you there's some pieces that you wanted to keep. So I would love to invite, uh, maybe I could do what um, Arden did last year yesterday, which I thought worked well, is if the person want, who wants to speak for their group can put up their hand and then we can, we can hear from, from groups. If you wanna share, there's, I'd love to hear some, some of your thoughts. Oh, thanks, I see uh, Robin is in the, the top of mine. My screen. I got voted as note taker. No, I, I, I volunteered to be note taker. Um, so we had a really great discussion and um, I guess our generative themes would be uh, UDL for sure. Um, talking about um, individuals helping, helping faculty or helping instructors um, embrace that everyone learns differently. And that if they could at their own rate, there's so many different um, deadlines and the end of semester and you have to learn this much by this amount of time to to reimagine how that could be uh, looked at 
<laughs> to be fully, I was talking about from my point of view, being fully inclusive, not having a segregated class anymore, which means I wouldn't have a job, but that's okay. Um, um, instructors sharing what works for your learning. So Emily shared from the beginning, instructor opening it up to students to say, so however you learn, um, this is what I can provide for you, rather than that uncomfortable conversation where a student has to approach a prof to say, I need this uh, presented differently. Definitely uh, relook at the space. We want to be outside more somehow. Think yeah. about how to do that. Um, uh, Emily, again, no fluorescent lighting anymore. And I'm, I talked about our Indigenous learning space at our college outside. It would be lovely to have more classes outside and enjoy that. And um, we also talked about how COVID really did help people figure out um, how they learn best. And, hmm. and it, it may not be that all students enjoy that, but it also forced us to teach differently and learn differently. So how do we take that moving forward so that people can take, take what they do enjoy from hybrid learning and faculty and instructors need to be able to embrace that, that maybe that is better for some students and how, how do we do that? Um, um, we lastly just talked about the grading piece. Can we get rid of grading altogether, Mary? We love that concept. Yeah. Um, maybe more self-assessment tools, some kind of reflections by the students um, to really identify what have they learned and, and take that away. So we had a great group. That's amazing. What a list. Phenomenal. Thank you. Tiffany, I'll invite you to, to, to go next. I mean, it's not a lot of time. Okay. Yes, you take um, over here. <laughs> so I think that we just talked about how we need to think outside of the bureaucratic model and criteria base that universities have. Sorry, my group had Marina and Jessica. Um, and how we can create new spaces for conversation. Um, yeah, so getting rid of that bureaucratic model and criteria based um, model, like just how criteria based creates um, barriers for students to even get into housing, right? Like most universities need to be a full time student. So if you drop that, how many more students could live in housing and have that inclusive of going in to live in housing? Also, um, thinking about how learning could be more community based. Uh, I was just reflecting on how one prof brought in uh, during the pandemic, this coffee shop model uh, the student really liked that class, continued taking a course this year with the prof, and it was a community engagement course through anthropology, and students, um, the end project was done every week, so students ended up doing a podcast, but every class the group got together, so that community-based learning was a really strong experience for the student, um, and then we were just envisioning how that Danny spoke because she's um, through UBCO. Just thinking of how a space like that could be replicated for all students on campus. Like, could there be a similar welcoming center, something like that, that all students can attend? And thinking of how inclusion facilitators' role could be universally designed to benefit all students. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Amazing. These are phenomenal ideas. Thank you. Marta. Um, yeah, such great ideas. I think for us, um, we, uh, we touched on like about maybe like three sort of main things. And one was around sort of just um, accessibility for all. Uh, and so really from the beginning, so students maybe like blowing up the accessibility department because there is accessibility embedded in, in each class. And so students, you know, not feeling that they have to disclose their, their disability or what accommodations they require, but just having that not to be like a space where they, they have to, they have to engage necessarily because it's all available to all students. Um, the other piece was around sort of, I think around more of the bureaucracy as well and um, supporting students, uh, but sort of almost having a mediator to support the students to, to for the student to, to, to talk to the professor, but like taking away that extra person and just having a university um, culture where students and professors can just have conversations together and talk about 
what's working and what's what's not working. Um, building building trust that way. So really starting with trust. Um, I hope I said that right, Lisa. Um, the other piece was about just having welcoming universities from the start. So like why have, you know, the grades, why is that sort of the, the, the most crucial thing? Can students engage in university in a way where they're starting with what they're interested in? Mm. And, and maybe building on that, you know, instead of trying to get into engineering right in the first year, and, um, you know, maybe that isn't actually something you want to do in five years. So engaging in that and making it more of a, an exploratory learning what you want to learn, as opposed to um, what you feel you need to learn. And of course, people could do that as well. So that would be what we talked about. Amazing. I like that. I like to blow up the accessibility services. <laughs> I've written that down. <laughs> uh, Lauren, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so our group was uh, Shelly, Karen, uh, myself, and Selena. Um, <clears throat> so we, this, the ones that came up as sort of generative themes, um, one of the big ones was that leadership was really intentional, that it um, centered around people with lived experience and either what they were teaching or what they were leading or what they were working on, mm -hmm. uh, and that that was prioritized. Um, we talked about plain language information for all students um, and just making sure that information that was shared from either the university or from professors or you know vice versa was done in a plain language way for everyone. Um, I know even myself as a student, sometimes it was like emails from the university would be like really intimidating and I had no idea what they were asking me to do or they felt very severe or like, don't do this prerequisite by this date, you're out kind of thing. Um, so like, why is that like that? It doesn't need to be. Um, that students have a say in the curriculum um, was a big one as well. Mm -hmm. um, so within a specific class, but also within a program of study or within a department, I think there's many layers to where that could um, happen. Um, and the more intent around um, student engagement, that, so that that would be um, student engagement would be a priority. And so we talked about a, diff a few different things for that, that intentional dialogue being built into classroom, thinking about what do individual students need to engage in a class and having flexibility um, to make that look like whatever it needed to for individual classes or students. Um, um, we talked about alternative ways to share and contribute. So yeah, that flexibility and what the actual content like of a class looks like, um, but also how students are contributing. So for a student who maybe doesn't want to engage in class dialogue, what are other ways that they, um, having that flexibility just be built in that there would be other ways that they could contribute and that would be seen and valued by the whole class. Um, we talked a bit about physical space too. Uh, we vented a little bit about terrible uh, elevators. Um, and lecture theater rooms that just have are is a room of stairs for no apparent reason. And the only place if you cannot use stairs or do not want to use stairs to sit is that like partitioned one table spot at the back of the class. Yes. Um, let's just make rooms flat. <laughs> that would be great. Um, and also with movable furniture. So that also came up as something that was sometimes a barrier is that furniture is like glued to or or connected to the floor in some way and actually can't be moved around for accessibility. Um, so let's get rid of that altogether too. Um, and then I think the last thing we kind of spent time talking about was the relation, having a, a relationship, a real relationship between all levels of education. So right from K, uh, we, so we went into the K to 12 system in ours too. So, so the university would be, would have a relationship with the high schools, would have a relationship with the elementary schools. And so, um, there would be that transfer of information and sharing of learning throughout. Again, such a great list. Covered so many, so many bases. We're getting rid of a lot. I like that. <laughs> and Andy, why don't you go ahead? Thank you. Um, one of the main takeaways we had was kind of what our role is. So what our role would be in the future. Um, so ideally, we thought we would kind of embed our role to the role of a TA, so just a supportive person in classrooms. And rather than have us follow the student around, like be assigned to a student, we'd be assigned to a classroom. Yeah. Um, one thing that we were kind of talking about as well is how benchmarks, like I 
it's difficult to get rid of them, but um, I would love to see like the way we reach benchmarks be changed. So keeping in mind that everybody learns differently and has different strengths that we could kind of display that through their benchmarks. That's great. I, I like that the, a TA per, per classrooms. It'd be like a TA for the faculty. It's out because that's where a lot of the problem lies. <laughs> Yeah. That was in our group anyway. Yeah. Arden, go ahead. Well, I was sitting here in a group by myself. So <laughs> I just thought yeah. the university <laughs> is producing all of the professionals that are labeling and segregating and justifying the othering treatment. So could we pull apart psychology? Could we pull apart education? Could we get rid of schools of special education and combine those disciplines? Yes, that's a great point. And Lisa is clapping her hands alongside. <laughs> Amazing. All right. And I there were some in the chat too that I think um, people have been putting in. I don't know if people are kind of reading along there, but I invite you to the in, into the chat as well to have a look. Um, and but I'm really conscious of time and and part of uh, Freire's work, which is really important, is that we just don't stop at theory and reflection and that we take critical action. And so for the last three minutes, what I'd like to invite everyone to do is think about those amazing ways to transform our institutions and consider something that you can do from your position of power and from your positionality and from your social identity around how can you take one of those things or something that you have thought of, and it might not be from this session, but from something you've learned over the past couple days. What is one action that you can take to transform our institutions? So something that um, I, I, uh, I, I just heard and I, I really appreciate is around, um, you know, re-looking at my, what language I'm using in my syllabi. Uh, I think that was Lauren, your group was talking about like, how do you make plain language? And something that has always been of interest to me is how we call uh, something like office hours are actually for students to come and visit me, but that's not what that sounds like at all. And so, you know, calling it student hours. Um, and then there was something else someone said about like having more opportunity for just conversation with faculty and being more available. So I'm, I have to have an hour of office hours for each class that I take, but maybe that's not enough. And to have more of a, you know, come and come and have and, and, and have tea or do something that's more enjoyable to sit down and, and chat, not about your class, but just about learning conversations. So in the chat, I, you know, there's going to be a, a someone brave who puts it in, or maybe what I could do is actually start typing it. And then I will say, go and everyone can press enter at the same time so that it's not like no one has to be the first. So in the chat, type in something, some action that you can take, whether it's, you know, um, being, being more of an advocate in some way or um, redesigning something or, you know, taking on a new, a new thing. But what, what action can you take based on this session from Freire or the sessions that we have been in? Maybe it's committing to one of the benchmarks teaching, uh, encouraging faculty to, to move their classrooms. I actually teach a class all outside. I did it once, and I'm gonna do it again in the fall. So if anyone wants to talk about outdoor teaching, let me know. All right, I'm giving you another 30 seconds to write down your thing, your action. And there's already some really good ones in there. So change the name of our integration facilitator to inclusion facilitator. These are great. So press go <laughs> as they're all coming in. And part of this is that if we put it out there and we tell people what we're going to do, that also makes us more committed to it. So your next task is actually to go and read people's things and and I invite you to hold each other accountable to that. So if you see someone that you work closely with say, I'm gonna do this thing, um, 
reach out to them and just say, I'm proud of you for putting that in there and how can I help or I, how can I help you be, be accountable to that action? So go through that list. I'm not gonna read them all because I won't be able to read them all and I don't, I don't wanna uh, favor any over others sort of thing. So just, um, yeah. Have a, have a read through, I'm gonna do the same thing. And just to, I'll, you might still be still be reading and when we, I'm gonna share one more slide just to finish off um, and then you can go back to, to looking at those. But thank you for, for taking on this task and for um, being willing to have it be engaged in dialogue and also um, engaging in action. And so this, this is called Praxis when we unite the theory and the practice reflection and action and to be engaged in that um, as part of our practice is really important. So just to finish, uh, washing one's hands of conflict between the powerful and the powerless means decide with the powerful not to be neutral. Therefore, the educator has the duty to not being neutral and education is never neutral. And we're all working in education spaces and places. And so I think for me, that means that um, we, we have an obligation to to wear our social justice hats, to advocate for, to, to be in these conversations. So, so thank you for um, yeah, engaging with me. And if anyone ever wants to reach out or talk more about these things, uh, feel free. <laughs>